and quickly. Um, just something to keep in mind uh, and then illustrate that with a few case studies uh, that will show you how those frameworks get applied um, in practice. Um, along the way, I'll mention uh, some resources or references, uh, a couple books uh, or websites that um, can provide more information on some of the things that I'm talking about, but don't feel the need to you know, take notes as I speak. Uh, I'm going to summarize that at the end for you uh, on the last slides. So uh, trying to make this a little bit more academic and, um, and, and be a resource for you as well. So let's jump in. Okay. All right, so I, I'd like to start by talking about the hand, the human hand, um, and over, over uh, evolution, we developed this opposable thumb, which allows us to grip things, to make tools, to transform materials um, and, and build. And it would be easy to assume that uh, the human brain with its advanced capabilities was maybe a reason why uh, we evolved the ability to manipulate materials like that. But it turns out that perhaps it's actually the other way around. Um, in the book, uh, The Art of Critical Making by Roseanne Summerson, uh, neurologist and researcher Frank Wilson suggests uh, that, or the quote is, the brain developed its capabilities as experience defined the role of the hand in our survival. Uh, in other words, the brain learns because our hands make. Um, and so in prototyping, we are making to learn. And that's the general umbrella theme for this talk. So this, uh, this is uh, the Three Horizons model that came out of uh, consulting agency McKinsey. Um, and this looks at the way that businesses think about developing uh, products and services and strategies. Um, and these three horizons are near term uh, in time, uh, mid, mid term, a little bit further out, a few years out, and then a far term horizon three, uh, which is looking at um, situations, uh, you know, how the world is changing and how they may want to adapt their business in the future. And so the, the horizon one, the one that's closest to us, uh, kind of like where we are now and maybe for the rest of this year, uh, businesses are focused on uh, running their core business, uh, maintaining that, maybe fixing problems with products, uh, addressing holes in their service, or extending it a little bit by adding new features and that kind of thing. But it isn't really until Horizon 2 that they're looking at developing new offerings, looking at the market uh, gaps and identifying places where they want to insert new products and services. And then Horizon 3 is really less about specific products, it's more about strategy and uh, forecasting the shifts uh, that, that are yet to come that they're going to want to address business-wise. And so regardless of which time horizon uh, we're looking at, uh, as we apply the design process, uh, we still, generally go about it in similar ways. Um, this is a diagram by Bill Verplank in his interaction design sketchbook, where he says that the core of invention might be a hunch followed by a hack, but an idea is needed to generate alternatives uh, and variations uh, based on these hunches and sketches uh, that we can then prototype and evaluate and test. And the goal is to derive principles that will organize the value of a product in a way that creates a paradigm in the market. And by that, we mean how is this product going to be unique and valuable and different from other things in the market. So as we zoom in on our current theme of prototypes, if we zoom in here, we then 
um, can learn from uh, Stephanie Hood and Charles Hill, who were designers at Apple Computer. And they wrote a paper in the late 90s called What Do Prototypes Prototype? And there they break out three different categories of prototypes. The role prototype investigates questions of what an artifact could do for a user. Uh, what is the functionality that might benefit them and the value and understanding why? How does it fit into people's lives? The look and feel prototype um, explores and demonstrates options for the sensory experience of that artifact. What does it literally feel like to engage with this thing? And how do we make that um, smooth and seamless or appropriate uh, to the role that it's trying to play in the context within which it's playing that? And then third, the implementation prototype, that's more of a functional role. So that's like, technically, how do we make it work? This is a, a very kind of engineering oriented perspective of material thicknesses, durability, what communication protocols are being used? Will this actually work in the way that we anticipate it? And, that, and those are used to, to derive the final uh, build specifications. In my talk, I'll primarily focus on the role prototypes coming from a human-centered design background. Um, and then towards the end of the talk, I'll also um, examine uh, some look and feel prototypes and how the prototyping process is like a feedback loop that it can inform the creative process there. So with that, um, I, I've organized the case studies into three applications. One is strategy, where we're looking at futures, and this is that horizon three kind of thing. And it's specifically about the role that, uh, that a product might uh, serve in a future context. Innovation, which is looking at contemporary market needs, um, identifying uh, opportunities to uh, get, you know, provide something there uh, and, and design and engineer and build for it, something that you might uh, go into production and actually release uh, in the near term. And then design, by which I mean user experience, interaction design, and that, that look and feel kind of immediate sensory uh, perception, making sure things are intelligible, um, satisfying, uh, and appropriate. So let's start by the, the longer term, Horizon 3, prototyping to inform strategy. So when we're looking at the kind of future, this is this being a future cone, time is moving from left to right. Uh, and as we think about the future, the further out we think, the more possibilities uh, of what could happen, what could become, um, it, it becomes a multiplicity, the further out you go. Um, somewhere in, in there, there's a narrower uh, subset of possibilities that are plausible. And by that, we mean kind of reasonable to believe that it might happen. Um, and then within that, there's probably a subset that is probable, uh, probable as in very likely to occur, you know, unless some unexpected circumstances happen. And so what's important to, to know um, is that futures practice is not about predicting exactly what will happen. Uh, no one can exactly guess that. And, and that's not the game that we're playing. What we're playing is uh, examining a multitude of possibilities um, so that we can have a conversation around the characteristics of the various uh, possible futures and uh, determine what ones may be preferable, what we do and don't want to happen. Um, and that, that's the conversation we're trying to have. 
Um, and so it's, we, we find that it's most useful to explore this space uh, beyond what is probable um, that's out in the realm of the plausible. Like it, it, it still could happen. It's still likely, it's still reasonable, but maybe certain um, conditions need to exist for that to, to occur or to become real for people. Um, and that, Exploring that space uh, is, is where interesting things happen. The way we uh, explore that and, and generate ideas for what this multitude of possibilities that we're comparing are, is by looking at trends and drivers. And the, the steep framework, which is displayed here, is a useful tool for that. And STEEP stands for social, technological, environmental, economic, and political trends and drivers. Um, so we're looking at this, these different lenses on society and listening for faint signals of what changes are emerging. Um, drivers, to clarify the language I'm using, drivers are macro level forces. These are the kind of sub, subconscious almost, subliminal um, motivating factors that, um, that spur change and development to happen. Uh, an example might be that we have currently a growing awareness of sustainability issues in our culture. Uh, and we can have a self-conscious awareness of the choices that we make as consumers having an environmental impact. That's not exactly measurable, but it's something that we can identify and point to as a driver. Trends, on the other hand, are based on facts and they're observable and they're measurable. So a, a, a correlating uh, example might be um, that when I go, um, uh, shopping uh, for a house or for hardware for my home, uh, there's an increasing um, selection of renewable energy uh, options uh, that I can tap into. I can get an electric vehicle, I can put solar panels on my house. Instead of using a gas powered generator when the power goes out, I can install an electric battery. Uh, and, and yeah, so these are things that we can see and, and kind of measure. And so we do that for each of these steep categories and, uh, and then begin to look at interesting intersections between them. Um, and so in this process of developing future scenarios, we intersect these drivers and trends that we research uh, and give definition to. Um, and those interesting intersections form future contexts uh, that, that we'll be exploring. Uh, some of them have more interest or potential than others. And so we choose obviously the more ripe ones. And then within those future contexts, in our design process, we begin to script narratives. We identify specific situations, locations, um, think about the people that are actors and players in those situations and what their, these, these new future characters, what their needs are, what their situation is, um, kind of uncovering uh, new possibilities for, uh, for ways that we can service them in new, uh, in, with new ideas and concepts for products, for services, for uh, applications of tech, new technologies and so on. But it's, it's well and good to identify all these things and you generate a lot of lists, but in order to make this palatable to others, to facilitate those conversations we wanna have, we need to formulate these things into vignettes, kind of shape narratives. We literally use creative writing, like fiction writing, to tell that story and maybe illustration to paint the picture so that allows other people to step into that world in their imagination and um, navigate that scenario, that situation, identify with the user uh, or person that we're, that we're trying to service 
um, and, and really speculate on how best to approach those dynamics. Um, and it's, it's then moved into the stage of learning on the right side, which is all about you know, having dialogue, presenting this to people and, and forming questions and trying to see how you can um, derive insights uh, about this future context um, and what questions come up that need to be further explored. So this is a quote by the ruler of Dubai. The future belongs to those who can imagine it, design it, and execute it. It isn't something you await, but rather create. And this quote strikes me as powerful because it speaks to the engaging optimism of will. Uh, and, you know, sometimes we just need to be given permission to fantasize, imagine, uh, and that's empowering. Um, and uh, and this kind of is a segue into a short story that I'll try to keep really brief and, and kind of move through, but it's about a project we did in Dubai uh, when we were part of TelArt, um, and that's called the Museum of the Future. Uh, but just to set the context, Dubai is this incredible place that over the span of two generations went from uh, a kind of smaller economy of, of fishermen and, and pearl divers and traders uh, to this incredible first world condition, uh, hyper modern uh, civilization. And so through the course of this transformation, um, they developed a culture that's rooted in this notion of progress. And in that context, uh, and, and as part of that drive for innovation, Dubai uh, hosts a yearly conference uh, that's, called, that's like a government summit for Arab nations in the region um, and other countries abroad who come in to discuss uh, government policy evolving uh, issues in that regard. And the, uh, the Museum of the Future in that context was a strategic planning exercise. The aim of that was to realize, communicate, and validate visions for the country's future. These were large scale immersive exhibitions that you would enter into um, and be transformed by. It's as if you're stepping into the future. We we're applied that process that I just described. Um, and in these exhibitions, you'd explore topics like human augmentation, uh, the application of artificial intelligence to governing the national economy, the future of urban indoor farming, or robotics and automation, how they may impact society. Um, and to give you a more concrete example related to what's on the screen, in terms of human augmentation, if there was the possibility to have, uh, like when you're having a baby, if you had the choice to augment that baby uh, with new technology that would give them some sort of special abilities, superhuman powers, speed, intelligence, whatever, um, you know, would you do it? Straight off the bat, it's not an easy question to answer. And uh, it gets into some hairy topics like who gets access to that and who doesn't? Is it only the rich people or is it certain countries that own the intellectual property? Um, there's a lot to navigate around these issues. And so, um, so what kind of regulatory policy needs to be put in place before this kind of stuff becomes available? or potentially out of control. So these, these are kind of deeper investigations and questions that we're facilitating the conversation around. And we do that by, by creating these future scenarios, uh, letting people enter into those co narrative contexts and present them with uh, tangible evidence of, for them to react to. And by making it real, we create this space for people to directly engage with one another 
and have a kind of a visceral response to what they're seeing, what they're experiencing to basically to facilitate the dialogue. Uh, these things were specifically designed to teeter on that line between being desirable and repulsive to really spark uh, interesting debate um, to help these people kind of wrap their mind around what position do they take around the topic um, and you know uh, what their critical views are about it. And um, we're, we're doing this to target people's emotions. We're making it tangible uh, because human beings make decisions emotionally. Um, this, this is the leadership of Dubai exploring uh, ideas around terraforming, which is like reshaping the surface of planets. Um, and you see how uh, the Sheik is, um, he's learning with his hand right there. Okay, so uh, a quick other example, just to um, round out this, this um, chapter. Um, Toyota Car Company debuted the Concept I at the Consumer Electronics Show in 2017. This was a concept for an emotionally intelligent autonomous vehicle. This automated car has an embedded artificial intelligence. Now this car, you can't just get in and drive off. This is a prototype. This is a very high fidelity prototype, but nevertheless, it represents an aspirational idea. And the story that it had to uh, contain and resonate was around building the relationship between the driver and the vehicle. Um, and so using this, this prototype uh, allowed Toyota to project their own vision for what the future might be, and or perhaps what it should be, um, maybe, I don't know, 15 years from now, wild guess. Um, but, but the purpose of doing that was to get everyone around them excited and rally around that same North Star and start marching in the same direction. So if you're intrigued by this kind of work, there's a new book that recently came out a few months ago uh, by Julian Bleeker and his co-conspirators at the Near Future Laboratory. I encourage you to check out their website. There's a lot of information there. Um, it's also a good read and it's well illustrated. So next is uh, the chapter on prototyping product and service innovation. Here we're talking about the second horizon. It's, it's kind of midterm, it's near term to midterm. What is the next generation of products? Again, we're approaching this from a role prototype uh, kind of perspective, primarily. Uh, it's less about what it looks like and more about how it's going to fit into people's lives. So when we aim to develop products for contemporary market needs, we wanna make decisions that respond to and respect the usage patterns that people already are demonstrating. We wanna know who they are, what motivates them, and what are their actual operating contexts to help us you know, design the, the solution appropriately rather than top down and from some sort of abstract archetype. It starts with an empathetic approach to research. Um, and this, this type of research is referred to sometimes as ethnography or customer immersion or customer development. Um, <clears throat> it's an open discovery of understanding the world of your customer or user. Um, what, you know, what drives and motivates them and what, what are actual pain points and um, what are their ideas for what would, could be better um, and, and what their context or situation looks like in real life. You have to kind of go and observe uh, and listen. 
Um, here uh, is a photograph where we went to work with Otis Elevator Company. Uh, this is in Boston. Uh, a, a new skyscraper is being built, and we're up on like the 20th floor of in wintertime. It's cold. It's loud. There's no internet. There's barely any electricity except for extension cables. Um, and we're talking to the mechanics who are installing elevators. And we're speaking specifically about the installation manual uh, that he's pointing to there. It's a book, but now it's also becoming an electronic version on iPads, right? And so now they have both. Which one should they use? You know, it's easy to sit in an office and imagine that, oh yeah, it's better on an iPad. It's, it can be in color and it can have video clips and that'll be helpful, right? But when you get there, you realize that it's loud. Okay, so you're not gonna hear the audio on those video clips. It's cold, so they got gloves on. Um, there's no Wi-Fi, right? Um, so, they may be in an elevator shaft that doesn't even have cell phone service, uh, right? So they can't connect to the mobile network. So now they have to make sure that they download all the stuff before they enter the job site. Mm, tricky, tricky. So you uncover all these different parameters uh, and forces and factors surrounding the idea of what you're trying to do. Um, and uh, so we approach this with a mindset of empathy and discovery. Um, and this is a, a, a mindset that is a shift from a being focused on the what to being focused on the why. Um, it's a way to go deeper in understanding that role that your product is serving in people's lives before you start getting fixated on what that solution you think might be. Um, and this framework it's called Jobs to be Done, and was pioneered by this guy, Clay Christensen, who's a professor at Harvard. Uh, and he wrote a book called The Innovator's Dilemma. I'll play you a short clip where he talks about and gives you another kind of brief example of that approach. Let me know if there's no audio. We decided that the way we teach marketing is at the core of what makes motivation difficult to achieve. The most helpful way we've thought of it so far is that we actually hire products to do things for us. And understanding what job we have to do in our lives for which we would hire a product is really the key to cracking this problem of motivating customers to buy what we're offering. So I wanted just to tell you a story about a project we did for one of the big fast food restaurants. They were trying to goose up the sales of their milkshakes. They had just studied this problem up the gazoo. They brought in customers who fit the profile of the quintessential milkshake consumer. And they'd give them samples and ask, could you tell us how we can improve our milkshakes so you'd buy more of them? Do you want it chocolatey or cheaper, chunky or chewier? They get very clear feedback. They would then improve the milkshake on those dimensions and it had no impact on sales or profits whatsoever. So one of our colleagues went in with a different question on his mind, and that was, I wonder what job arises in people's lives that caused them to come to this restaurant to hire a milkshake. So we stood in a restaurant for 18 hours one day and just took very careful data. What time did they buy these milkshakes? What were they wearing? Were they alone? Did they buy other food with it? Did they eat it in the restaurant or drive off with it? It turned out that nearly half of the milkshakes were sold before eight o'clock in the morning. The people who bought them were always alone. It was the only thing they bought and they all got in the car and drove off with it. So I'll, I'll stop the video here. Um, what he's getting at is that the milkshake was the perfect companion for people who have a long distance to drive in the morning. And from, from that new perspective, that discovery, we can say, Aha, uh -huh. maybe the way to serve them better is not by making the shake cooler or creamier, but, but to perhaps improve the lid and the way that it fits so it doesn't leak in the car. Um, or maybe add a drive through window to the milkshake shop so that they don't even have to get into the car. Now, 
This might be a very American example, but I hope you get the point uh, of the approach. So this investigation of milkshakes and this approach to understanding the, the user or customer um, is, is, a, is a deeper psychological approach, a, a way of putting yourself into the customer's shoes uh, and trying to uh, imagine what it's like to be them, uh, to better understand what, they're, what value they're receiving from your solution. Um, and so, yes, a milkshake is a functional, it has a functional job and that's to be a yummy treat. We now know it, it can also serve an emotional job as a commute companion. And there's other jobs, social jobs, which can appease the kids when they're going bonkers and you have to schlep them somewhere, it happens. Um, so, so this is a breakdown in a way of getting underneath the skin of the psychology from the, from the user's perspective. Um, jobs to be done. Okay, so going back to the elevator example, uh, maybe a slightly different elevator example, but, but um, when we do this kind of innovation with you know, manufacturing corporations, uh, we do uh, a lot of this kind of uh, talking to people, interviews, observations. Uh, you have to get to a certain number past 10, 15, 20, 30 people, once you start getting into some quantity, you're, you're starting to blend qualitative research with quantitative research. And you start to uh, see patterns emerging from what you're observing and hearing. Um, and those patterns start, start to kind of uh, paint a picture of where the opportunities lie for an intervention or a new solution or a change. Um, yeah, so, so we then go into this mode of doing a design sprint workshop where we generate tons of ideas for, for a lot of this stuff, sort through it, pick the, pick the most juicy, compelling concepts, which often come in the form of just a post-it note or a little sketch, little pencil sketch. We take that and we kind of on the left side here, we, we explode that out and, and analyze what the assumptions are in this one little concept idea nugget. And we take the most important assumptions and design quick little experiments that can allow us to validate those assumptions. And this exercise can be really short and sweet, um, but this is prototyping. This is a form of prototyping here. Um, in the example that's on the screen, uh, we're talking to customers of the elevator company who are building owners that put elevators in their buildings. Uh, we're talking to them about what's working, what isn't. And they say that a big part of owning an elevator is the service, maintenance, regular checkups, fixing things that are squeaky or broken. And they have a lot of issues with that situation because they are never really sure when the mechanic is coming. They, all of a sudden the elevator's out of service because the mechanic turned it off so that they can diagnose the problem. Maybe they need to run back to the shop to get a spare part. They know the elevator's not working correctly so they leave it out of service. The, you know, the, the building owner doesn't know how long for, what's going on, they need more visibility. They told us that we came up with this idea of multimedia communication. Can we provide visual evidence? Can we provide messaging that gives them a real time view into what's happening? And how, you know, we can then validate in a, in a lightweight, quick way, uh, what is that? Is that valuable to them? Is this a, is this a good idea worth pursuing? We can send them an email, like go on a real job site with a real mechanic. And when that situation happens, trigger an email with an attached photo and say, here you go, here's an update. I hope this is helpful. 
Um, I attached a, a picture. Is that useful to you? And get a response and, you know, uh, do this maybe 10 times over. And, you know, if nine out of 10 responses come back, hey, thank you. I appreciate that. And yeah, the picture is helpful. Then we know we're onto something and we can pursue this further. But, you know, we're not going to go design a full app and code it before validating that that's even a good idea, right? Um, and so that's how we kind of sort through these alternative, alternative ideas and variations that Bill Verplank's spiral diagram was hinting at. Which brings me to the eye of the duck. The duck. The eye of the duck is a metaphor for the most important aspects of your concept that needs to be validated. Um, this is a term that came from David Lynch, who talks about every film having an eye of the duck scene, something that is really pivotal to making that narrative work. Um, and I'll, I'll play a short, semi-short, uh, funny clip of him talking about it for a moment, so you can kind of get it from him. Bear with me on this one. You know, nature uh, can teach us a lot of things. And there's something about um, uh, in, in painting, you're, you're working within a certain shape canvas. And there's many things that you, you know, you do, one does intuitively uh, to move the eye. You know, uh, there's repetition of shape, repetition of color. But when you start looking at a duck, um, you see your eye is moving in a certain way and you see textures and colors and shapes and you start wondering about a duck, uh, what it can teach us about, you know, any kind of abstract, you know, painting or proportions or even sequences, um, scenes. And it always is interesting that the eye is in the perfect place. If you move it to the body, it would get lost. If you move it to the leg or the beak, it's two kind of fast areas competing, even though the eye is the fastest. It's the little jewel. Fast meaning what? Well, there's slow and fast. Um, a, an empty room is a certain speed, and a, a person standing there is another speed. And that proportion is, is you, know, you know, can be beautiful. If the room is a two and the person is a seven, I think a person is around a seven fire and electricity can go up to a nine, for instance, or a really um, intricately designed, you know, decorative room is, is pretty disturbing. Sometimes it's, it's too fast. But then if you put something slow in it, it could work beautifully. And in a busy room and a person, they fight each other. It's a relationship thing, I think. Fast and slow areas. I believe every film has uh, a, a, the eye of the duck scene but um, it can fool you, you know, which, which one it is. It could be the scene we were talking about. I, I don't know. What's the eye of the duck scene in Blue Velvet? I used to know. Um, is it the In Dreams song? It's the eye of the duck. That's the eye of the duck. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, um, that was interesting. Um, <laughs> It works though, it, it, it does work. There is something about it. Uh, for us in this particular project example, uh, we wanted to prototype the correct eye of the duck. Uh, and for us, it was this aspect of using video and multimedia to give real-time updates between the mechanic and the site owner. Um, and so we came up with a sketch for what that might be. Um, and basically the, the, the story is how, how this came to be was that we were, we came up with this idea during a workshop that was being held in a hotel conference center, right? And, uh, there's like 20 people in the room for, you know, four, three or four days working through these problems and identified this as a potential solution that might be desirable. There was a elevator mechanic that was in the room. I 
tugged on his sleeve, brought him out outside of the room and said, let's go upstairs. We went to the second floor. I said, open the elevator and pretend like you're inspecting it. And then take my cell phone and record yourself sending a message. And, and he did. Um, and we created this quick little sketch, little prototype that uh, illustrated that. Hey, idea. Tim, this is Bill, your Otis Elevator Technician. Just uh, doing some maintenance on uh, Elevator 1 today. And I uh, just wanted to give you a quick rundown of what we did. Uh, we noticed that the chain needed some tightening. So here's the operator here, and uh, we took care of that today. Checked on your belt, condition of the belt is in good shape. And just did an overall uh, inspection of everything on top of the elevator and the hoist leg. All looks good. So um, we're good to go at this point. All right, thank you. The fun part was that we didn't get permission from the hotel to do this. The guy just has a key. He knows what he's doing. He's a professional. So we, you know, it took a minute, um, but it was fun. And then the next day we showed it to customers who were part of this workshop um, in this mock-up that you see on the left and said, this, like, is this it? Is this a solution that would that would bring you value and, and kind of alleviate those pain points that you you told us about? Yes, they loved it. They, they said, yeah, do that. So, so we did. So we had to work out the logic of the app um, and build out a more high fidelity prototype um, to represent the narrative uh, of its use. Uh, and and, and this, uh, this was captured as, a, as an animation, which was then presented uh, during the pilot program rollout, it was presented to like four, 400 you know, service managers from around the world because Otis you know, has elevators all around the world. Um, this is what it looks like. So this is mo a mock-up of the customer requ requesting service because something is squeaky in, in, in their elevator. Um, they get notified that the office received it and then the mechanic on the left side accepts the job and says, I'm going to be there at 12. You know, now the building owner knows that the mechanic is on site. The mechanic goes, inspects the elevator, records in the system what he thinks he needs, adds a picture of it. Now the back office knows what equipment to prepare. And uh, he checks to see if the contracts covers this part being replaced. No problem, mm -hmm. wonderful. So um, he records the message. Hey Tim, this is Bill, your Otis Elevator Technician. Adds a little note, sends it off to the building owner who receives the note and is able to view that video in near real time. Hey Tim, this happening. is Bill, your Otis Elevator Technician. I'll skip the rest because you've obviously seen the video before. If you're interested in this kind of innovation design sprint, uh, this is a good resource, a uh, reference for how these activities are structured um, and how to get through them creatively uh, and make it fun and exciting. This is out of Google Ventures. Um, they've kind of codified the process a little bit. There are other variations by other groups out there it's you know uh it's a design sprint process um if on the other hand your focus is more on building a business than building a product you may want to reference this uh, lean startup methodology it applies the same sort of approach but to uh on a business level um, so that's another good resource I'm gonna give you another example in this category, just to make a point. The importance of establishing evaluation criteria metrics and building a test plan. Um, the elevator example that we just looked at was for discovering the role for a new product, that kind of horizon two we talked about earlier. Um, this is a little bit closer to near term, it's more Horizon One. This is for an existing app. 
um, and in giving it an, a new feature that extends the capability um, of this app. Um, uh, so we were approached by a, a home insurance company that has an app called Home Check. This has nothing to do with your billing or your policy. This is strictly speaking to educate people on how to uh, take better care of their homes uh, with preventative maintenance. Um, so as to prevent issues from arising that the insurance company would have to pay for. Uh, so in a way, it's a win-win for both parties. Mm. In, this, um, in this case study, we're not really going to look at the prototype itself, but really focus on the process of developing a research plan around that prototype. We know, we, we know what the role is. That was a given at the beginning. Here we lay out a kind of a UX journey, a user experience plan, how we're going to bring people through this feature. Um, and, and it has to do with inviting them to this, uh, to, to experience this feature, uh, giving them some instructions. Um, and the only thing I guess I want you to know in this example is that the ex there was an existing feature called tasks and tasks are simple. Uh, an example would be it's winter and you're, it's starting to be freezing outside. Uh, you might have a, a water tap or faucet outside. You may want to shut off the water to that so that the pipe doesn't burst when it gets really cold outside. Simple. Missions, on the other hand, they wanted to make them deeper, more instructional content, more media, um, make it more interactive where you're kind of going through something that might take seven to 10 minutes uh, to, to learn and investigate and so on. Um, and so how do we get people to do that? Um, how do we get, draw them into it? And how, you know, what kind of a reward do we give them? Uh, so this is what the conversation was for the, for the UX. Each of these steps then had an artifact uh, associated with it. Uh, the provoking might be a notification on your app pops up. Hey, you should try this, you know. Um, when you get into it, the artifact might be the content. Uh, the, the media and the text that gives you the education you need. Um, because this is a bigger, heavier process that we're asking people to do, they may not immediately just go start doing it. So maybe we have to remind them and give them some incentive to do it. And then once they're doing it, we'd like to know that they actually did it. Uh, and so we start to analyze what is it that we're trying to learn about each of these steps, about the design uh, specifics of each of these things? So we prototype this app feature and we create this plan where we're trying to answer different questions about different uh, aspects of this journey. Um, and these questions are critical to, uh, to pair with a prototype. Please don't read the text on this page is way too much, but everything that I just told you is on the left and on the right side um, is where we're thinking through what are the methods that we're going to use to get at answers to those questions. Are we going to do A-B testing with different groups of people and modify the feature in a different way? Are we going to step through the experience with uh, one of the, you know, some of the customers on a telephone interview and ask them what they're seeing and how they're responding to it and what feels good, what doesn't. Are we going to use a survey to email blast 50 or 100 people at the same time and really go for that quantitative measure? Um, or do we use analytics inside the app to tell us what people do, at what point do they stop, uh, who opened the notifications and who didn't? So there's different ways to get at the answers to these questions, but all of this has to be thought through to create a comprehensive 
uh, testing plan for your prototype. And so at the very minimum, what questions will accompany the prototype when you put it in front of people? We got some data back. We put it into like an animated presentation uh, that, that the project team at, on the client side could, could um, showcase to their leadership at, a, at an internal conference. We learned a bunch of things. Uh, they gave us pointers that um, allowed us to iterate and cycle through the design process to improve and fine tune that design before it went into development. Um, so I, I won't go through the rest of this video, but I think the point is made. Uh, and my friend Jan Kubashevich has a, a, a cool quote that captures this, that design research is design practice and vice versa. Designers, when they design, they research. In other words, what designers do through various processes and activities is a way of inquiry and a way of knowing, right? Again, to the beginning of the presentation with the hand, our brain is learning by our hand making. So the last um, chapter of case studies here um, is prototyping for user experience. And where most of the prototype uh, types <laughs> that we've looked at so far, we're really strictly in that role category. This is more about the look and feel type of prototype. What is the kind of sec sensory perception? Uh, what is the cognition happening? Um, and, and how do we make that appropriate to the situation? Uh, and this exercise uh, is kind of uh, the feedback loop that mechanism that happens where we kind of evolve a design by by doing it here we're just using some blue tape painters tape on a wall to mark out in a museum where a digital screen interaction you know interactive exhibit screen might go um, and we're using a projector to fill that space um, with some wire frames and we're trying to evaluate you know, what is the correct type size? How much content should there be? Um, what's the relative sizing of things? Uh, how, you know, how many screens of interaction or pop-up elements are comfortable at this scale? What does it look like from far away? You know, if you only design for a 60 inch screen on your 13 inch MacBook, um, you're never really seeing your work at full scale. Uh, and it's, it's really important to just um, efficiently like get it as close to the, the reality that you're trying to portray as possible. Uh, and this can be, uh, this is what it ended up looking like uh, when it was done. Uh, this can be done really cheaply, right? Paper, cardboard, and tape to mock up what this kind of audio listening station with a video screen might be like in a museum context. Uh, these are props that allow us to interrogate ideas and, um, and do it at scale in the context. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's kind of like play. Um, so this is the last like, case study story here. This, this is for an interactive that we created with the Detroit Institute of Arts, who is renovating their Asian art galleries. And for the Japan gallery that they had, they, they wanted something that would interpret the traditional Japanese tea ceremony um, and allow new audiences to understand it and appreciate it a little bit better um, and see what those artifacts that are behind a glass case are all about um, and, and, and um, you know, just get a little bit more education around them in a fun way. Um, so I'll play this really short one minute video that 
that's an overview of that project. So we get that out of the way and then I'll show you how we kind of prototype our way into it. Make a moment in the garden, be still. ようこそおいでくださいました。This tea bowl called a chawan was chosen from my collection to honor you. Before the tea is made, a host symbolically purifies the utensils. A host may train for years before being considered a tea master. So we started this process with that immersion kind of research, going to a tea house, experiencing this ritual for ourselves,、um, breaking down that process、um, through a, like a user journey. Uh, mapping out what happens first, what happens next, what tools and implements are used at which step of the process, what are you seeing, hearing, feeling, thinking along the way. And condensing that narrative, which spans about 45 minutes in a traditional ritual, down to something closer to four minutes. And so we had to work with the museum、uh, Japanese culture specialists. To make sure that that abbreviation is done respectfully、uh, and accurately、uh, maintains portrayal of the, the full thing.、Uh, you know, we, we looked at the artifacts, we met with the curators and the archivists、uh, who, who maintain and can tell us more about these artifacts and, and what's special about them. We looked at the space where this thing's going to fit. We gathered a lot of information and then began. Prototyping the, the, the look and feel of this、uh, experience, or maybe even earlier than that, we just grabbed a bunch of、uh, objects from the kitchen and around the studio and, and set up a, a whiteboard horizontally about the, the correct size for the table that we were aiming to create and placed them on the table because the whole game that we we're、um, set out to play is.、Um, Combining physical objects that, allow, that、uh, visitors can manipulate with a narrative story that's on this、uh, video table. And so、uh, I'll play a little、uh, clip of James,、uh, uh, James Smalls, who is the lead designer on this project, where he's reflecting on what we're learning by doing this. Originally, we had thought that it would make most sense to kind of keep these physical objects placed close to the display cases at one end of the table,、um, but quickly realized that that means only one or maybe two people can reach any of the objects,、uh, which just didn't feel ideal. It didn't feel communal and participatory in the way that we liked. So that allowed us to kind of make an adjustment right away. Since we're doing this whiteboard, we could just erase all of our guidelines. Make new ones in the middle and start to kind of plan the experiment around that arrangement,、um, which worked out well for us. So, that was the, the, the first step of like getting towards a wireframe of what, what the narrative might be, how the objects and the, the story that happens on the table relate, what is the spatial layout, and so on.、Uh, next, we took it up a level in fidelity、uh, and creating these wireframes on a computer. We attached a projector with some clamps above the table and, and started using it as a projection screen where we could modify the wireframes rapidly on the computer and also be able to share them you know, in PowerPoint presentations with the client and so on and annotate them and work with them.、Um, and 
So that became a really fun way to kind of mock up and be able to have text blocks um, and shapes uh, and, you know, mixing with these objects and with people around the table, seeing what happens when other people come up um, and are standing by and, and listening or come up and just grab an object. What happens in the narrative if some unexpected visitor comes and grabs the object, you know, um, working through all these different situations. Once we had the, the wireframes and we wanted to test with more users, invited more people in, in to uh, be tests, uh, testers for our experiment. And we upgraded to having a TV flat um, and uh, ran through it this way and refined the narrative um, to make it presentable. When it was ready, um, Still in wireframe mode, we brought it to the museum and orchestrated, uh, you know, ja Japan Japanese culture specialists to come in and go through the narrative and in the interaction and uh, give us input and feedback on what's working, what's well, what's not, uh, what you know, what's captured well, what could be different uh, before we get into the final production of this thing. Uh, the the Funny story with this is that the museum uh, in Detroit is about a three hour flight from where we live and we were just there for a day. So um, we couldn't really bring our big TV with us. So we just flew there, um, went to an electronics store, bought a TV, um, brought it to the museum, went in the basement and found this uh, pallet jack, which is like a forklift, but manual, you know? And, and put the TV on that, raised it to the correct height, uh, taped some cardboard around it, and, and voila, there, there's this interactive tea table with our wireframes. And you can see the cable uh, going to James's laptop or iPad, I think, in that case. Uh, and he's driving the experience from his iPad there for these people to step through. Um, and so they gave us really important critical feedback that we incorporated into the final design uh, that we then, you know, up with professional animators coming in, sound designers, um, voice uh, actor talent being recorded in a studio, you know, mixing the whole kind of media production to, to execute this after, I don't know, five, six, ten rounds of this kind of progressive up of prototypes. And until we arrived at the final products, uh, which the museum was, was garnered uh, uh, an award for from the American Alliance of, of Museums uh, yearly competition, which was nice to hear. Um, and people seem to love the, the experience. Um, so just to summarize my talk and uh, yeah, strategy, innovation and design are three ways of applying uh, prototyping. Um, to meaningful impact. These are false categories, admittedly, I made this up. Uh, you know, it's all a similar game. It's just kind of how you use it that makes a difference. In prototyping to inform strategy, we were looking at that far term, horizon three, future vision, using prototypes to facilitate decision-making or plant a flag on like a future destination kind of North Star vision for a company uh, to kind of gain alignment uh, from people. Um, there are some resources here. I'll make this talk available so you, you have the links after the fact. Um, prototyping for product and service innovation. That was the more midterm horizon two looking at contemporary markets and contexts, understanding the customer, uh, jobs to be done, pain points, trying to understand how to, what is the role of next generation products and how do we make that happen? Um, design, design sprints, lean startup, and of course the eye of the duck. And prototyping for user experience, looking at the look and feel, uh, feedback loop, it's very near, near term, it's about perception, it's about cognition, 
and it's about user experience. If you're into this kind of thing, the Interaction Design Foundation and uh, CIID in Copenhagen is a school. They both have a lot of good kind of community and resources for digging deeper on that kind of a practice. Um, Bill Verplank's Interaction Design Sketchbook, it's a PDF, it's available online free. Um, it's worth reading, it's, it's a good read. Um, and I leave you with one word, play. Um, thank you for, for listening to my talk. Um, feel free to reach out if you, you know, if you have questions, we'll, we'll, we'll transition now to a Q and A. Uh, happy to answer any questions or revisit any of this material. I know it's been an hour or more and um, I'll stop talking and pass it on. Pass the mic. All right. Thank you, Jack, uh, for this absolutely excellent stuff. And also thank you for sharing uh, the presentation with us. So then we'll distribute it um, uh, to uh, with, with our groups. Uh, um, and questions, then do you have any questions? Yeah, I have one. Um, I okay. Believe, yeah, uh, so uh, as you've said, you've got loads of experience behind your back. But what I'm interested in, uh, in like looking back, what would you say uh, as a person with like limited experience just coming into the creating of the projects and making prototypes, what would you say that uh, now looking back, you, are, you realize like were your most uh, overlooked things and like mistakes you've made? Because we're all young people and we don't have plenty of experience. So maybe we could learn from that. Yeah, thank you. That That's a good question because um, I think the first thing that comes to mind is, um, is rushing through the process. Um, it's often not our intention, but is a constraint um, put on us by our clients uh, who order our, our services from us uh, that they need this thing yesterday and it just has to happen. And like, can't you just give us the design already? And really, if you slow down and you listen and you look and you do the, uh, more of a progressive, iterative, um, cyclical kind of process uh, where you really get to test things out and, and, and you can, you know, any concept for any, yeah, any concept really, you can break down and into pieces and validate different aspects of it using different prototypes. Um, and you'll find that with each one, you learn something valuable that makes the whole sum of the parts uh, fit better together. Um, so any advice that I might have in that regard is to like fiercely defend the space and time you need to work creatively and to listen to what the work is giving you. Don't just rush to some sort of assumed conclusion as best as you can. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Arseni? Yes, yes. Uh, so I have a question. Um, what is it? What do you think? Uh, what is the difference between a uh, UX designer and UX researcher? <laughs> that's a that's a good question. Um, yeah. So uh, you know, design research. I harked on about how these things are just really kind of two sides of one coin and or, you know, are synonymous in many ways, um, but they're, yeah, so UX designer. So the researcher's focus is a lot more leaning into gathering inputs, particularly initial inputs that help you better understand what it is that you should prototype 
And then once you create, have a prototype, perhaps evaluating that prototype, creating the prototyping plan, uh, asking the right questions and so on. Whereas the, the UX designer would be, their role would be focused a little bit more in the middle, taking those inputs and yes, participating in the research part, but, but being the person who is doing the design part, which is the, you know, designate to, you know, creating the sketches, creating the proposition, the proposed solution, crafting the prototype uh, for evaluation, and, you know, and yes, participating in the testing process and hearing firsthand or seeing, observing the response that people have to the prototype, but they'd be more on the like creating based on what's been learned. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yep. For thank you for incredible uh, presentation, and I want to ask about uh, strategy. And um, there, there is, um, for instance, there is a moment uh, where we um, can't use strategy because of, uh, because of lack of time, and uh, we can't create strategy. Yes, because we just have no time. And um, what should we do? this case, uh, because we all know that without strategy, we can't uh, create uh, another tasks and what to do. Yeah, that's a, yeah, uh, geez. Um, you're always using some kind of strategy. Um, um, when you make a design of some sort, you're proposing a particular arrangement of things based on some reasoning. Um, and so you, as a designer, you have to um, own up to what you know about that reasoning, the rationale for why this uh, design solution is the proposed one. Uh, you may not have time to explore as many um, alternatives as you may like, um, and that sometimes is the case, but it's never the case that you put something forth without mm, having some thoughts or feelings about why it's good or what makes it compelling or why is it appropriate or something. So that conversation there is that positioning is the strategy uh, part of it. Um, so it's hard to it's hard to say that it's never there or we don't have time for it. Um, it's inherently part of the, um, the design, I think. Um, so you address it as best as you can with the time that you have um, and be as clear and forthcoming about all of the rationale that your proposed design is based on. I'm, I'm, you know, and list that out, lay it out. If you don't have time to write it down, say it. Because that helps people uh, who are receiving this thing or viewing it um, better understand why you made certain decisions. Um, and yeah, and, and, and hopefully um, trust in your good judgment as a designer. Okay, mm -hmm. Asani, I think we have one more question for you, Word. Okay, <laughs> yes. Uh, so I have another question, ah, or, uh, about, or Alice needs to uh, have a question. Or, or uh, you were first, sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. Go. So uh, what do you think? Uh, what should a <laughs> junior UX designer know? Uh, and is it enough, for example, to know at the beginning about CGM and, or, or about user flow, or uh, they, is it, uh, for example, this designer uh, needs to know something else? 
And what can you uh, tell about uh, the level of uh, middle or senior? What, what do they know? Yeah. Um, a junior designer doesn't need to know anything. They just need to have curiosity and a willingness to learn. Um, and, uh, and a certain amount of confidence to ask questions and to uh, propose thoughts, ideas, um, and, uh, and contribute to this because design is a team sport, you know? Uh, it's, a, it's a conversation. Um, and so when you have a dinner party and there's one person who says, I'm too young, I'm not gonna say anything it's less of an interesting conversation. Uh, and everyone has life experience, even if they're younger, uh, that can inform uh, valuable perspectives on situations. Um, oftentimes too, uh, younger people uh, or people with less um, professional experience have this um, license to, I don't know how to phrase this nicely, uh, but I use it all the time in my own life as a designer, like to be the one who can ask stupid questions. And honestly, companies oftentimes um, come to us for design consulting. They, we, we go into their world and their situation uh, because we are naive, we're not you know, entrenched in their reality, their understanding, their propaganda of like what they tell themselves is real. We're able to come in with fresh eyes and say, huh, why are you doing this? Or what is that word you're using? I don't know what that means. That's a bunch of nonsense. The way I see it is this, you know? And so you can have that kind of um, approach that can be valuable because maybe asking a question that nobody else would because they'd be embarrassed because, oh, they have 20 years experience or something, like can open up new avenues of discussion that can truly like um, change the course of action, which is really cool. Um, uh, as far as like mid-level uh, and senior, um, I mean that, yeah, that's, uh, that's a whole topic to explore and, it, and there's different kinds of design studios and there's, you know, everything from like, massive uh, corporate scale has, you know, 15 offices around the world, IDO kind of machine churning out design and consulting and products and all kinds of stuff. Now that gets very stratified and those levels have much more specific um, requirements perhaps. Uh, and then there's small studios like ours at Big Dreams where five people, sometimes scaling to eight or 10 people, depending on the number of projects going on and what kind of uh, specialty uh, talent we wanna pull in to, uh, to solve a particular problem. Um, and we all wear many hats and we're a mix of ages and experience levels, uh, but we all play as equals and contribute to, um, you know, we, we play nice uh, with each other. Um, so it sort of depends on the context, but uh, if I can, I don't know, add something more specific to it, to the answer, it would be that the more senior you get, the more you have to be aware of the business side of things, um, contracts, terms, um, you're also applying the, years of experience that you've gained in order to help clarify it. Like at the beginning, when you're first negotiating with a client, you have to define a scope of work and basically state what is the problem that we're trying to solve. Sometimes clients come to you for design and they think they want something. It's pretty clear to them, I, I'm, I want this. You got to design this. But you start looking at it, talking to them, asking questions, and you realize, but they're saying that, but here's what's actually missing. And 
you know, and that, right. And so being able to create the scope of work and define what is the design challenge being solved? Where does it start? Where does it end? Um, is a lot informed by having done it a bunch of times in different contexts and being able to kind of um, uh, provide some perspective on that. Uh, and, you know, and some of the leadership stuff uh, uh, that, that comes with um, uh, helping multiple people work together and run like parallel projects, in, you know, and, and make sure everything's kind of orchestrated and running smoothly, that kind of thing too. Thank you. And Alice, we have a question from you. Uh, yeah, thank you. I wanted to ask, uh, have you ever worked uh, in, with sensitive topics or sensitive contexts, for example, uh, related to trauma or topics that uh, uh, people don't have uh, uh, social consensus on? And what would be your advice on that? Thank you. Hmm. Hmm. I need to think about that. The things that come to mind, like there's, there, we, we have gotten into sensitive contexts, but it's less, it's in my experience, it's been less on the kind of personal, emotional, sensitive thing. And it's more like um, trade secrets or, um, uh, you know, new technology kind of stuff that can't be revealed to competitors or, um national security issues um things like that so that's not quite parallel um to what you're talking about um trying to think you know we i we've worked with kind of culturally sensitive issues i mean even the detroit institute of the arts tea table thing had an element to it of like wow, I'm going to take this ritual, this 45 minute ritual that is completely foreign to me and I can look at it and I can interpret it for what I think it is, but their values and are very, very specific and different that I just don't even have access to. And yet I'm in the position of uh, needing to um, create an interpretation of that for a public audience. And so I have to be very mindful and sensitive um, and check myself a lot um, as a designer, uh, making sure that I'm being respectful um, and, and uh, accurate in my portrayal. Um, but I'm, I fear that maybe that example doesn't even uh, get close enough to what you're asking. So. I think that the short answer is I don't have as much expertise in what you're talking about um, as uh, as I wish I did. Yeah, okay, thanks. Anyway. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to mention it made me chuckle a little bit when you mentioned how uh, juniors are not supposed to know a lot, right? And then most of the job postings I see for junior graphic designers, they are requiring two, even three years of experience somehow. Sometimes it's crazy. Well, you know, <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, like the, um, the tools have gotten much easier um, and are including a lot more user onboarding, um, and resources within the tools and surrounding the, the tools uh, for it, learning how to do it. I mean, you can pick up Adobe Premiere and want to edit a video and, you know, the amount that, of things that you can look up, tutorials and things like that, it, it doesn't take too long to get somewhere educationally uh, and with access to internet, you, you know, you, you can, so like, do you need three years of editing experience to be able to edit a video? No, mm -hmm. um, you don't. Um, I, I think I, 
probably understand why they put those requirements, but I would, um, I would encourage you to visit them or get, pick up the phone um, and talk to somebody and say, Hey, you know, like, um, I don't have, I don't meet this exact metric requirement, but um, I'm a quick study. Uh, I know where to find out what I need to know uh, to get the job done. And uh, I have a passion for learning and for making, um, and I will, you know, go above and beyond uh, a reasonable measure to make sure that I'm doing this correctly and meaningfully uh, with you. And so if you believe in me, I'm, I'm here, I'm game. You can go look for somebody else, but, or you can just like, let's start now, you know? Yeah, I, I guess I would get discouraged by that uh, years of experience. That's something you can verify by asking if you worked anywhere, yeah. That's valuable advice, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? No. Okay. So, um, oh, is that Josh? You want to ask something? Or? Just saying, just. Uh, ah, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, not, it's not a question, but just to remind also, of course, the healing the city that we'll, we'll meet afterwards. So exactly. Keep on. Thank you. Yes, yes, I was uh, just going to, to, to mention about that. So, Jack.